to you. Hey, and welcome to uh, you download MMT. In this in today's episode, I'm going to try to uh, go through a couple articles that I saw that made no sense, and I kind of cruised them a little bit. Um, but I will be going over them. Uh, they're both basically uh, claiming that MMT failed, and but the problem is they they keep going back to the same uh, talking points. Um, and I'm going to do my best to debunk them and do my best to uh, show other reasons why MMT is not a failure and actually why MMT is the answer uh, to a lot of different questions about um, Medicare for All and uh, Green New Deal and, uh, and jobs uh, guarantee as well. I have a, I'm going to be showing a few videos. Uh, all of which uh, are brought to you by um, Deficit Owl. So I'd like to thank them uh, for posting it. Um, I, yeah, thank you for posting it and be right back. Oh, welcome back or welcome to the show, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I said moments ago I was going to go over the Sri Lanka thing. Uh, I'm obviously no expert. I do not have the the uh, subscribers to say I'm an expert. Uh, anyway, uh, if you do want to subscribe because you think I'm an expert or because you like you like how I say how I describe MMT, then please do. Uh, much appreciated. Otherwise, uh, check out progressives.org. Uh, slash donate, slash volunteer, slash just uh, look them up and look around and see if you like what you see as far as the part goes. Anyway, so I kind of need to go over what uh, my monetary theory is. Again, this is from Investopedia. Uh, MMT is a heterodox. What is a heterodox? Let's go find out what that is. Uh, let's see, what is a heterodox economy? And this is why people, you know, anti MMTers tend to go after it. Uh, heterodox eco uh, economy, uh, economics is the analysis and study of economic principles considered outside of the mainstream or orthodox schools of uh, economic thought. Schools of heterodox, heterodox eco economics vary widely. They have a few common characteristics other than propounding theories, assumptions, or uh, method methodologies that fall outside of a of or con contradict the mainstream Keynesian and neoclassical movements. Now we have to remember we are under the Keynesian or neoclassical movement of economics right now. Meaning, anybody and everybody who has learned how to be successful in those things are the ones who go after modern monetary theory, or those who think that modern monetary theory are the reasons for certain countries going down when uh, there's quite a few things that are involved in those countries' crisis that, have, that are contrary to what MMT actually states. Uh, like, for instance, uh, France being a part of the euro. A MMT -er believes that if you you have to be the issuer of the currency, not the user, in order to you know be able to pay your debt, as far as being a, a government a government entity goes, like the U.S., the U.K., um, Canada, Japan, those places, they control their own currency, they control the interest rates, they control. Uh, how the Congress or the parliaments or whatever have you control the money, the money spending portion of the, those economies. Uh, France, they may, I think they may um, control the, the amount of money to a certain degree, but they don't, they're not in charge of where the money comes from. That's the uh, European Central Bank. It's just like the Fed is here, that sort of thing or not. Anyway, yeah. So let's see. Da, da, da. Heterodox schools of thought uh, include far left theories such as socialism, Marxism, and post Keynesian uh, economics, uh, as well as those associated with ra uh, radical free market, uh, 
economics such as the, the Austrian school, heterodox uh, economists often employ research methods of tools that originate in other disciplines such as psychology or physics to uh, economic questions. Heterodox uh, economists refer to all the various theories and schools of thought that are outside the mainstream Keynesian and neoclassical approaches. A wide variety of, comp of uh, competing and conflicting uh, economic schools of thought can at any given time be classified as heterodox uh, economics, though their ideas may eventually enter the mainstream. Which we're actually kind of seeing it just a little bit here and there, but the wrong people are in charge of the money in regards to that. Uh, heterodox economists play an important role in developing new ideas and challenging established schools of economic thought. Heterodox theories such as the, in the Austrian business cycle theory or ABCT and Minsky's financial instability uh, hypothesis rose to public prominence during the Great Recession because they pro they provided powerful explanations and that mainstream theories didn't. Now let's read this. Now let's read the the rest yourself. Let me go back to the. I can find it now. <laughs> Previous. Uh, nope, that's Sri Lanka, but not the same one. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'll do. <laughs> let's see. Uh, maybe, no, there we go. Okay, so let's see. <clears throat> Uh, what is modern monetary theory? Now, I just went through the heterodox portion of things. Macroeconomic framework that says monetary sovereign countries like the U.S., U.K., Japan, and Canada, the ones I just said, which spend tax and borrow in fiat currency that they control, fully control, are not operationally constrained by a revenue when it comes to federal government, federal government spending. But simply, such a government, such governments do not rely on taxes or borrowing for spending, since, uh, since they can print as much as they need and are the monopoly issuers of the currency. Since their budgets aren't like a regular household, their policies should not be shaped by fears uh, of rising national debt. <clears throat> Several other differences also exist between mainstream, uh, monetary, uh, mainstream monetary theory and MMT, the most important being the sequence of events that emerge from loans and deposits and from government spending and taxes. MMT challenges conventional beliefs about how the government interacts with the economy, the nature of money, the use of taxes, and the significance of budget deficits. These beliefs, uh, critics say, are a hangover from the gold standard era and are no longer accurate, useful, or necessary. MMT is used in policy debates to argue for such progressive legislation as universal health care and other public programs for which governments claim to not have enough money to fund. Let's see. Uh, core principles of modern monetary theory. The central idea of MMT is that governments with a fiat currency system under their control can and should print or create with a few key strokes in today's digital age as much money as they need to spend because they cannot go broke or be insolvent unless a political decision do, uh, to do so is taken. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, some say such spending would be fiscally irresponsible as the debt would balloon and inflation would skyrocket, but according to MMT, large government debt isn't the precursor to collapse that we have led, been led to believe it is. The countries like the U.S. can sustain much greater deficits without cause for concern, and a small deficit or a surplus can be extremely harmful and cause a recession since deficit spending is what builds people's savings. MMT theorists explain that debt is simply money that the government put into the economy and didn't tax back. That's true. They also argue that comparing a government's budget to that of an average household is a mistake. While supporters of the theory acknowledge that inflation is theoretical, a possible outcome from such spending, they say, is highly unlikely and can be fought with policy decision the future of if required. You often cite the example of Japan, which has much higher public debt than the U.S. Now, the difference between us and Japan is, well, actually, more or less, is 
is more or less the difference between us and China. Because China actually, I looked it up today, is actually uh, is the largest manufacturing of goods in the world at 28%. Um, that started in 2010. Uh, they started with cars and materials for cars and stuff like that, uh, such as, you know, like these days, it's uh, semiconductors for pretty much anything electrical, I think, or uh, uh, that involves tech, uh, cars, computers, um, cell phones, laptops, uh, you name it. If it requires a semiconductor, China actually, China has the, I guess you can say, a monopoly of it, uh, of that, of those industries. And since, I think, since our country has actually gone away with a lot of the manufacturing, um, since, all since uh, the late 90s, I think, um, this country, uh, hasn't didn't that doesn't really have much of a, uh, of a tech supply chain now it seems like intel will be coming in here shortly to bring more tech uh manufacturing jobs here which is good uh but that's one of the things that uh has inflation going up is because we, we don't have a robust supply chain and actually a lot of economists uh if you see on t tv they talk more or less about uh, you know, the too much money being put in the economy and, you know, stuff of that nature. They almost never talk about the, uh, the current uh, supply chain constraints because they don't want to talk about the supply part because they want to be able to have less spending, uh, more, more taxes for the people who can't really afford them. And they don't want to have any of their money, you know, be put in jeopardy. But then also a lot more like hedge funders and <clears throat> CEOs, people who actually benefited from the supply chain disruption, uh, who benefited from price increases in the in the overall market. Um, and even now, they're actually calling for the Fed to not um, to not uh, bring up interest rates, which. It's funny because when, when this whole thing first started, they were doing nothing but asking for or telling the Fed they should raise the rates of interbank loans, basically money that is being loaned to to to, uh, to banks inside the, the the monetary system for overnight rates, uh, stuff of that nature. Uh, now they're saying they don't want it because I mean, either way, if you look at it. Uh, interest rates were meant to stifle loans, stifle spending. And actually, in, and the only way that will happen is that the supply chain was up and running. Uh, there wouldn't be the surprises, the surprises, excuse me, the prices would be down because there would be more inventory and companies would be forced to bring down uh, their prices at the stores. Uh, gas wouldn't be lower than it is now. We actually had a reserve of gas, but Donald Trump, uh, in his infinite uh, wisdom, decided to start selling that uh, internationally. And there was a, and not to cut this, but uh, the, there was a text that I that I had been uh, sharing for, not text, excuse me, uh, a um, a uh, tweet. Uh, he bragged about uh, he, he bragged about uh, telling uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, and Russia uh, to uh, to cut back on their oil production because that would make oil skyrocket. Most because of the fact he knew that since we have a reserve, he could sell that overseas and make some money for, you know, for the big oil here. When in reality, what we should be doing is actually cutting ourselves off the oil a little bit because we already know that eventually oil in this plant will be either overheated or there'll be supply, there'll be a gas and oil shortage, which means that if we were already on you know, renewable energies, solar and wind power. And by the way, just so, you know, you might be thinking, well, what if the power goes out as far as, uh, as far as those things go? Well, no, there too, also there's upper, there's batteries that are also out there big enough to be able to hold, you know, electric uh, that are renewed, uh, are from renewed energy. Um, anyways, point being there is uh, that would actually be a way of getting off of fossil fuel and have fossil fuel being like the last resort for energy. It said the first, uh, the first line of energy uh, that we use. Anyway, so the point being is, so 
places like Sri Lanka, uh, they one of the things that NFT says is you shouldn't um, you shouldn't take, borrow money from out from outside countries and outside uh, uh, that uh, from outside uh, borrow from outside your currency. You know, you know, from outside of a currency you don't control, and that's what happened, I think, in Sri Lanka. They took out loans from China, Japan, um, IMF. They still, they currently have a, uh, uh, they're currently restructuring that deal, and um, oh, somewhere else, um, the money markets. You know, like more, there's more uh, short-term loans to money markets than they are from China and other places. In fact, um, it's certain. I mean, China, China had to pull out of uh, their U.S. their uh, U.S. Treasury holdings here because they were losing money because of the whole uh, economy in, uh, in Sri Lanka uh, so that they don't have to spend more than they have to as far as upwork goes. I mean, China's had no inflation really uh, because they <laughs> they sell more product than they, than they buy in. Uh, hence, which is why they're 28% of, of, uh, of the world's uh, manufacturing. So they sell more than they buy. We buy more than we sell, it seems like. That's why we have such a big de uh, uh, export deficit or import deficit, uh, a export import deficit. That's why, because we, we, we buy more than we make. Um, and that kind of goes with the GNP, which is, uh, oh, uh, oh shoot. GMP is the uh, uh, it's, it's a natural product. I think it's a, the general natural product. Said the anyway, I'm kind of getting that part wrong. I'm still learning very much so as far as MMT goes, but I had the general gist of it. Just my communication is not very good. I see it's um, GDP gross national oh gross national products for this. Anyway, I told you sometimes my communication is not very good. Anyway, as you can see from my subscriber pool anyway um and for those who are sticking around thank you i appreciate it i hope that you continue to do so and i hope that you tell your friends and family whomever else they may want them to learn how this uh the fiscal world really really uh really goes anyway so let's see government money creation according to mmt the only limit that the government has when it comes to spending is the availability of real resources like workers, construction supplies, when uh, etc. When government spend, spending is too great, with respect to resources available, inflation can surge if decision makers are not careful. And that's what happened here because our supply chain was not there because we let China and other places take over that take over those because it's uh, cheaper to make and you can sell for the for the same or more prices or you know for the same more profit here. It was taxes create an ongoing demand for currency and are a tool to make or to take money out of an economy that is getting overheated, says MMP. This goes against the conventional idea that taxes are primarily meant to provide the government with money to spend to build infrastructure, fund social welfare programs, etc. What happens if you are if you were to go to your local IRS office to pay your taxes with actual cash? Wrote Warren Mosler, the same old thing. Uh, I, I do recommend the seven deadly innocent frauds of economic policy. Uh, basically, he's saying that uh, pay your taxes with actual cash, wrote MMT pioneer and American economist Warren Mosler in his book. The, as I just said, first you would hand your money over and your, your pile over of currency to the person on duty as payment. Then they'd count it, give you a receipt, and hopefully a thank you for helping to pay for Social Security, interest on national debt, and the Iraq War. Then after your taxpayer, after the after you, the taxpayer left the room, they'd take that hard-earned cash you just forked over and throw it in the shredder. MMT says that government doesn't need to sell bonds to borrow money since there is the money since that is the money that it can create on its own. The government sells bonds to drain excess reserves and hits and hit its overnight interest rate target. Thus, the extent of bonds, which Moser calls savings accounts at the Fed, is not a requirement for the government, but a policy choice. 
Unemployment is the result of government spending too little while collecting taxes. According to MMT, it says these looking for wait those looking for work and unable to find a job in the private sector should be given minimum wage trans transition jobs funded by the government and managed by the local community. This labor would act as a buffer stock to help the government control inflation in the uh, economic uh, in the economy. Excuse me. You're back. How do I feel when I'm alone? You know, sometimes when I'm alone, you can get the feeling like I'm doing this by myself. The more that you have the confidence to do things alone and persevere do things alone, the better person you are and the better time you can have with other people. Ha, <laughs> paper, yeah. I'm Paperboy Love Prince, and I'm an artist, an activist. I think the best way to find your community and find your tribe is just to be yourself. That's easier said than done, but it's really about exploring your interests. The more you get into that, the more you'll find people who are excited about the things that excite you. I love creating a whole futuristic vibe that's never been seen before. Activism is about being active. A big part of it too is about reaching the people that are often forgotten about. So that's why we try to use fun methods and creative methods to reach people that the academics aren't reaching. We're the ones that, you know, need to connect with them to actually build this community because we're from this community. My Black feels like the future, and that's a future where anything is possible. Well, look, the, the bottom line, from what I can see, the difference between but the mainstream buttheads out there who think that MMT is a bunch of crap uh, should really look at the financial system that we have currently that has no or very little regulation that is able to uh, allow for corporations to take advantage of tax laws and the fact that they have congress they have their they, they have their hands up congress's tail and controls what they do um pretty much literally uh if you look at the environmental aspect of spending you have someone like a joe manchin who is knee deep in cold BS and gas and oil. In fact, if you look on his uh, Open Secrets page, he is number one in everything anti-environmental. Number one in coal as far as donations. He's number one in gas and oil as far as donations. And the fact that Schumer, who also, I believe, gets... Um, uh payments from gas and oil and financial of course uh for him to allow matching to stay on and yet take him seriously in regards to his um saying he wants to see inflation go down in order for any other environmental spending or spending on environmental type issues um is absurd and laughable. If you do uh, environmental, like uh, environmental spending, like Green New Deal, that has actual shark teeth to it, uh, and not prior type teeth to it, uh, kind of put in a different perspective there. Um, he would lose money on a personal and professional level. So with him at the helm. Um, nothing's going to happen as far as the part goes. Not only that, but renewable energies is like Medicare for all. It is a it is a, uh, infl a deflationary because if you have renewable energies, that takes away the power of the uh, electric companies, the heating companies, and all that. They can't charge you as much as they want to because those things are not uh, federally regulated utilities, as far as I know of, uh, they are 
controlled by corporations as, who set their own prices, as we've seen with, uh, with hikes in utility bills over the past quite a few years. Uh, that's the reason why uh, Washington State, for instance, has a uh, subsidies program to people who don't pay as much in electricity or use electricity, and so they get money back. I know because I've been through it. Uh, I had a studio in Seattle uh, that I was not really paying electricity on because I wasn't using much electricity and i got a check in the mail for it or at least you know deposit anyway so there are so that's the reason why there's a program about that but if we have renewable energies there would be no need for those kind of programs uh so everything that mft uh, is wanting to get done is long-term deflationary meaning people will save money meaning that corporations would not have a reason for hiking up insurance claims or insurances on their employees for the medical insurance if there was a single-payer health care system. That means that hospitals would probably get paid uh, faster. Um, there would be, and actually, if you look at it, that would actually leave room for increases in, say, wages or contractual wages. I know that some doctors actually are a are on a uh, uh, kind of a contract sort of, sort of deal, I think, um, which means they get paid a certain amount. Uh, but anyway, I, I may be wrong about that last part, but the point being is everything that MFT is for is uh, focused spending, knowing that a, a uh, knowing that a country that borrows in its own currency and has no outside currency debt will not go broke. We'll have the money to spend on things that are natural resource, whether it be outside the fucking country or inside the country. That's what MMT is about as far as I can, as far as, far as my understanding of it. And to have someone, some people in office who obviously get paid by those they're supposed to uh, regulate and supposed to go after when they uh, take advantage of people. Those people should never be in office, should have never been in office. Uh, they should reinstate something more than a former Glass-Steagall. When Glass-Steagall was around, we didn't have a financial crisis. That was the reason why we had a glass steagle was because we had a financial crisis because big corporations took advantage of everything in regards to finance. That's what capitalism is, is people with money taking advantage of the country. Natural resources, pretty much anything that can be bought and, bought and sold, they do. They, that's their business, bottom line profits, not people. Despite the fact that the people of the world is their consumer base, but because of the fact that people can can have other people in regards to you know anyway, basically the point of being there is there is no way this country, any country that controls its own monetary currency, can go broke. So these people who, unlike this, the supposed conservatives, uh, they are the same ones that talk about inflation like, like it's something we can't control. We can control inflation. It's called bringing back manufacturing. It's called having a $40 minimum wage. I'm talking $40 because that is with inflation over the last 40 years. That's $1 per year more. But that goes with the cost of living. So for anybody who doubts MMT, look in the past of what MMTers have said before those things actually happened. They have been right. The people like Larry Summers don't know shit for shit. Literally. He thought that raising interest rates would be a good thing. Obviously not. 
because that takes away people's ability to pay for goods and services. You don't need that in an economy that's barely hanging on. Anyways, be right back. By the way, sorry about the rants, but a little frustrated as far as people's not wanting to acknowledge MMT as what it is. That's something that this country needs to uh, incorporate as a way of looking at the economy. It's not a policy. It's literally the way to look at it. I'll be right back. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, that was... <laughs> wow, I have another raider. Or someone just played Screamo. Yeah, I think that's what happened. I think I have another raid, though. Um, <laughs> Andy Attack 2018, thank you for the raid. And this and Slayer music. Thanks for playing Screamo. Um, hey, welcome back. I'm just going to continue on with this. Um, anyway, so it says five trillion spent, and all I got was inflation. The problem with this is the fact that not they're not taking into account the severity of the um, supply chain severity of the fact that people who had jobs mostly were in the service industry um, and the ones that were not in the service industry were able to continue working at home. Uh, computers, you know, every everyone between, I think, um, uh, uh, pretty much anything involving computers as far as work goes, you know, like the accountants, the whatevers, you know, uh, those, those type of people that I guess have degrees in accounting, as I, as I just said, uh, or coding, computer programming, those sort of things. Those, those guys can be at home for a little bit and work and get paid. While as restaurant workers uh, or stadium workers, those people, they were kind of shut out for a while. Um, hence is why they needed the, the, uh, uh, the enhanced unemployment. Um, but anyway, let's see. Uh, see, most obvious problem was the impact of dramatically increased demand on supply stricken economy. With the economy shut down due to government uh, mandated restrictions, the, the flood of stimulus payments led to demand a boost. Given the best, uh, basic uh, economics of supply versus demand, prices rose. As expected would be the case, the implementation led to a massive surge in inflation. Again, it was it was the supply chain portion that was all messed up. And actually, there's a article that I'm going to bring up here pretty soon explaining that about 30% of people saved or paid down debt. So it wasn't like they were uh, just saving. They were also paying down their own debt because, well, sooner or later, they kind of figured that even you know, credit cards and personal loans and stuff like that. So essentially, we were going back to... Which we, what we had, be, you know, before two thousand eight, which was a credit based economy, um, which we still, which we've always had, really, uh, since the inception of credit, uh, whether it be credit cards or you know loans of some kind, you know, that sort of thing. Anyway, so let's see. Uh, wages failed to keep up because wages have been stagnant for the past forty years. That's the reason why wages keep failing because minimum wage at the federal level has stayed at 725, I think, since Obama. So his, I believe his first term, they put up to 725. And given the fact that in another, in another episode, I said that if they left it up to the corporations, corporations would bring up uh, you know, wages to bring in more people uh, then as soon as, you know, their inventories, uh, their grocery inventories, whatever, else, you know, their pretty much the product inventories went up, then that meant that either people would have to be laid off or 
they would have had to take pay cuts. And that's exactly what's been going on, been both layoffs and cuts as far as wages. Uh, so if wages had actually gone up over the past 40 years, the inflation was happening, then people would have a better chance of, of saving. And people wouldn't have, wouldn't have, like say, wouldn't be able to have a savings of, uh, for, for, for a $400 um emergency or some to that effect you know they would if they would they would have the financial capabilities of saving enough money to be able to go you know and stay off work for a long period of time <sighs> let's see uh, and injecting money that's a cop out it wasn't uh, they they weren't injecting money as in like spending too much they were spending too little and focused and focused spending just to be clear about that a lot of, a lot of the money that they injected was through mortgage backed securities which dollar for dollar adds money to bank deposits which then allows them to loan based on what the person has to loan against like for instance if you uh, if you notice uh, corporate, uh, corporate real estate companies have come in and purchased up, uh, I think like 18% or so of the $300,000 homes, uh, with, but they've been buying them at above market value, meaning that they actually hike up, um, rents around the area artificially because those how those homes are now worth you know more than say three hundred fifty thousand or so, but big real estate companies like the Blackstone or uh, BlackRock come in and buy those. One of which is a, a foreign investment uh, based uh, company. The other one is obviously one that that uh, that buys up real estate no matter what. Uh, so, anyways, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. The following graph shows the average American now ha has a record deficit requiring more than 4500 4, a new debt annually. No, that's, that's not right either. Uh, people's net worth have gone down. They, 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 due to the fact they haven't had money to be able to, uh, uh, Spend on rent and stuff of that nature. Let's see, we're done. Mm -hmm. By the way, the Fed is the net interest payer of U.S. Treasuries, meaning that when they do take them and take money, uh, they give it to Treasury, which means it's a economic uh, expansion. Uh, which I think is part of the reason why uh, someone like myself is going to begin the boost in Social Security next year. Quite a bit of a boost too. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, despite the massive surge in central bank intervention, it, like the United States, has had little effect on economic prosperity because interest rates have gone up. Which interest rates are the the uh, price setter among uh, in the overall economy through goods and services. While stock markets have performed well, no shit. Anyway, uh, economic growth is roughly equal to. This century's beginning, Japan remains plagued by rolling recessions, low inflation, and low interest rates. Actually, Japan's done a lot. Japan's done a lot more in regards to bringing people out of poverty and housing and stuff of that nature a lot better than we have. And they've kept interest low, and they've had low inflation because of it. Let's see. Be right back. Uh, Anthony, basic income. So here's my thing. I am not categorically opposed to a basic income. I just don't know what people are really trying to do when they say basic income, because there are a thousand and one varieties of this thing. Sometimes people say, and some of my, um, some of the people I know who are very wealthy say, 
We should just have a basic income and get rid of all other social programs. So Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, uh, um, housing assistance, all that stuff goes away. And then we just send you a basic income, 30000 a year. You figure out how to save for your retirement. You figure out how to get your health care. You figure out, right? And we'll send you a check, and then you work all that other stuff out. So it, our pay for is eviscerating this social safety net. I think that is extraordinarily um, reckless. I think that replacing programs that have constituencies, lobbying groups, people who are prepared to stand to fight for to defend those programs, swiping all of that away and replacing it with a promise of, of a check, free money if you like, the next Congress that comes in, what's the first thing they're going to cut? The free money. The basic is going to be the first thing to go. It'll get whittled down until it's all gone. Meanwhile, you've compromised the safety net. Now, not everybody puts forward that. Some people say it's not a replacement for, it's a supplement to, and then I'm willing to to talk about that. But yeah, I generally prefer the job guarantee because it aims the spending at the people who need it. It aims at the unemployed. I don't need a basic income check. And people who make more than I do certainly don't need a basic income. And so I, my worry, one worry I have, does everybody know what this basic income is? You get a check and you get a check and you everybody gets a check. So $30,000. Well, if you're poor, you're going to eat right through your basic income. It's going to be gone. But if you're wealthy, you're going to take your 30000 and you're going to buy Apple stock or you're going to whatever. And so your, what it does to wealth inequality concerns me a great deal because the poor are going to go right through it, consume the whole thing. The wealthy are going to invest and then it's going to exacerbate already um, dangerous levels of inequality. So that's my concern. I had a question about the uh, federal guaranteed jobs that you spoke mm -hmm. to. My question is what makes um, or what evidence is there that the people would continue to produce at a good level? Like if I have a guaranteed A in a class, I'm not going to do anything. So I mean, generally speaking, I wouldn't go to class if I was guaranteed an A. So why would somebody who's guaranteed a job produce or try to improve themselves or you know, help the company out? Okay, well, that's a good question. So first, they're not necessarily working for a company. Uh, this is, these can be jobs, and, and some of our faculty in the economics department here have written lots and lots about this. So you can read some of Professor Forstatter's work, for example, if you're interested. But the, the job guarantee doesn't mean you're guaranteed a job, we'll send the check, you do what you want. It doesn't work like that. It is, workers are required to show up and they're required to work and they're required to be there on time and records are kept and you can be fired from your job. It is a guarantee in the sense that the government is saying if you are ready, willing, and able to work and you cannot find employment elsewhere in the economy, we will find suitable work for you at a minimum level of pay. Okay, so you show up and you're a screw off and you're not performing and so forth. That is recorded, and after some number of times, bye-bye. Now you're out, and you won't be hired back into the program. And so you're living on zero instead of living on whatever the basic wage is. Hey, welcome back. Uh, I think I'm going to do my last uh, story of the day. And this has everything to do with uh, hypocrisy in regards to uh, conservative GOPs, you know, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of times when conservatives want to go against any kind of federal spending, they're always, you know, uh, they're always going, uh, they're, they're always saying, uh, talk about we can't spend because of inflation, and we can't spend because of debt, all this other stuff. Yet, uh, they take advantage of it as well. So this is from 2020, as you can see. Uh, and this is after railing against federal spending, GOP lawmakers, conservative groups benefit from government aid program. 
Oops. There we go. So let's see. Uh, conservative members of Congress and advocacy groups that ardently criticized excessive spend, government spending uh, were among those accepting small business pandemic relief funds from the Treasury this year, according to data released Monday. Again, this was in 2020. Uh, American for Tax Reform Foundation, led by firebrand anti-tax advocate Grover Northwest, or Northwest, not this, North, uh, Northwest, took a loan between one hundred fifty thousand and three hundred fifty thousand from the paid from PPP, the and uh, the Ayn Rand Institute, and Citizens Against the Government Waste, likewise accepted loan funded by the program. And remember, I believe Trump was, Trump was still in office at this time. Um, I think so. Anyway, <laughs> my opinion is, yeah, they took advantage of the same damn thing. Uh, let's see. Groups on the left also received these government funds, but applying was an especially tough decision for many longtime critics of big government who suddenly found themselves in need of federal support. The CARES Act has created a, a moral dilemma for those Americans who value freedom, reads an explanation essay posted by organization leader on the website of uh, Ayn Rand, is Ayn Rand? Ayn, I'll just say Ayn Rand Institute. The pandemic has cost them their jobs, their savings, their businesses, and they blame a significant part of this loss on the government. Because, but because they oppose government handouts, they worry that accepting CARES Act and CARES money would be a breach of integrity. The organization named for the mid 20th century author who influenced libertarian and conservative thought said that it chose to take government funds unapologetically for advocates for a freedom, individual rights, and limited government to turn down these relief funds means choosing to play only the victim's role in the government's bizarre game of loot and be looted. American for, Americans for Tax Reform Foundation is one of two relative related, related tax revision groups led by Norquist, who famously said, I don't want to abolish the government. I simply want to reduce it to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub. Uh, see, in the statement, the foundation said it applied for the funds after being badly hurt by the government response to the pandemic. So basically, they're saying that because the government, they had to take money from the government. Uh, after being hurt, badly hurt by the government and uh, response to the pandemic, it did not oppose the program when it passed, received the loan, and has ha uh, has as a consequence been able to maintain its employees without laying anyone off, the statement said. Uh, at Citizens Against Government Waste, a communications director, Alexander Ab Abrams, uh, made a similar argument to justify accepting a loan between 150000 and 350000 In our 36-year uh, history, we have never sought or accepted taxpayer money this is not taxpayer money spent in the economy it hasn't even taxed out yet, uh, she said. But the unprecedented cl uh, closing down of the U.S. economy to fight against the spread of COVID-19 and its significant impact on our funding sources and threatened our ability to provide continued employment to our staff. Uh, had we laid off our staff, uh, had we laid off our staff, they would have qualified for unemployment benefits at a significant cost to the taxpayers. We determined the better path was to apply for federal funds and provide employment continuity, continuity to our employees. Okay, so another government watchdog, Taxpayers for Common Sense, applied the same logic. Steve Ellis, president of the widely cited nonprofit uh, advocacy uh, group, said he wrestled with whether to accept government help. The organization's 178,500 loan. Is the government's funding the nonprofit has accepted its in its first government funding the nonprofit has accepted in its 25 year history, he said. 
It is necessary to continue the organization's work with includes, uh, which includes advocating in favor of CARE Act spending transparency. Uh, I didn't take the decision to apply for a PPP loan lightly. If I was sitting on a pile of cash, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have applied. Alice, uh, Alice said in the email, but we're not, and I have, and I need staff to work with me to vote, to hold policymakers accountable for how our tax dollars are being spent in the future. Again, it's not taxpayers' money; it's spending before ta before uh, taxing. It wasn't just the spending hawks who received these funds. A loan of four hundred twenty-two, uh, four hundred forty. Uh, damn, a loan of four hundred thirty-two thousand. There we go was provided to Citizens for Responsible Ethics in Washington, a group founded by Norm Eisen, who worked in senior position in the Obama administration. Uh, several capital area consultant firms received loans, including Fusion GPS, a firm that in 2016 investigated Donald Trump's Russia ties for Republican and Democratic clients, including Hillary Clinton's campaign. Okay, so in other words, yeah, that was, that was a fraudulent uh, investigation anyway. Uh, the company declined to comment. Why? A leading conservative fund, uh, fundraising firm, FLS Connect, received loan up to $2 million, wow. according to government records. The firm, which has worked for the Trump campaign, oh, uh, did not re uh, respond to requests for comments. Hmm. Uh, Full House Resorts, a company headed by the husband of Susie Lee, uh, Democrat uh, of Nevada, was among several gambling organizations that received PPP. At least five other members of Congress benefited from PPP loans given to business owned by themselves or their spouses. The list includes uh, Roger Williams of Texas, uh, Vicki Hortzler of Missouri, uh, Kevin Hearn of Oklahoma, Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma, uh, and uh, Vern Buchanan of Florida. Williams, uh, one of the wealthiest members of Congress, said in, Mar uh, in the Mar oh, sorry, in the May 5th blog that his auto dealerships had received the PPP loans, although Williams has been supportive of CARES Act spending, he has traditionally advocated for a sharp and limited role of government in U.S. society. I'd like to see us get to where government does three things, collect my taxes, defend my borders, help with infrastructure, and get, and get the heck out of everybody's life, Williams said in an interview with uh, Epoch Time in March. A socialist wants you to get a check from the government. A capitalist wants you to get a check from the place that you work. He later continued. I see so much wrong with that. But anyway, uh, the R Street Institute, I think take that supports free market e economic policies, was almost, I'm oh, sorry, was among several libertarian leaning advocacy groups that received PPP loans. R Street Institute's president, Institute's president Eli Ler, uh, or some other, I'm not sure, said his organization supports the CARES Act and also supports making PPP loans applicants, applicants public, adding that he would prefer to see even more transparency with respect to loan recipients. Uh, our position has never been that the government has had no role in the economy, uh, he says, adding that CARES Act is exactly the sort of situation where we support government intervention. Among the loan recipients revealed Monday is a company owned by her and a KTAK Corporation of Tulsa, which owns fast food franchises. It received between 1 million and 2 million that he, it said would support 220. So, one million and two million to support 220 jobs. That seems aggressive as far as the bar goes. I can see like 1.5 and all. I guess, I, yeah, I don't know about that. That, that, that seems like more is going to him than it is to employees. Uh, 
and out uh, her now spoken advocacy uh, uh, balanced budgets urge the Senate to increase the size of PPP loans available to franchises. So basically, he just he basically did what uh, what the heck is his name? A Shark Tank dude. Um, oh, frick! I forgot his name now. O'Leary uh, did as far as his businesses go. The same damn thing, except. Well, Larry came out went on television and said that uh, that that uh, the uh, quote unquote the uh, money uh, money helicopter shouldn't be raining money on on private citizens, despite the fact that he did exactly what this person did. Except he came out against it. This guy apparently has not. Anyway, this person I should say. Anyway, so uh, okay, so increase the size of people green loans available to franchises. According to March 24th letter to Senate leaders Mitch McConnell and Charles Charles E. Schumer, uh, in the last 10 years, our country's national debt has grown from 10 trillion to nearly 22 trillion. This trajectory is not sustainable, Hearn said in 2018. While there is no easy fix to this, the first step is clear: stop adding to it. Uh, but in 2020, as the uh, economic crisis set in, Hearn voted in favor of CARES Act despite its contribution to the national debt, saying in a release that this is a bailout. This isn't a bailout. It's a repayment of what the government has taken away from American workers and businesses. Right. Uh, Miranda Dabney, a spokeswoman for Hearn, said the letter was a bipartisan idea meant to simplify the way loans were calculated and said the franchise rule that Hearn advocated did not benefit KTAK because it employs fewer than 500 people. She said the program has achieved its uh, intended objectives. These PPP loans are all about paying employees, so any expansion or increased funding measures were aimed at helping employees of franchi franchisees stay employed, then he said. The whole program was designed to keep people off unemployment. Three businesses, three businesses owned by Buchanan made the name and made, made matched the name, excuse me, and locations of businesses that received PPP loans. Car dealerships, Sarasota 500 received between 2 million and 5 million. Another uh, auto dealer uh, uh, registered as 600. Uh, LC uh, received between 350,000 and 1 million, and Nissan, the Elizabeth City, uh, uh, received about between three, 350,000 and 1 million. Buchanan's office did not return a request for comments. Uh, several businesses affiliated with Mullen may match the names and locations of entities that receive PPP funds. Uh, they include Mullen, uh, Mullen Plumbing Inc., which received between 350000 and $1 million, and Mullen Plumbing West Division, which received between 150000 and 350000 Meredith Blanford, a uh, spokeswoman, uh, said Mullen is not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of his business and referred specific questions to his companies. <sighs> so these obvious... There's one thing that I would love for a politician to look at, and that's the Fed, uh, that's the Fed daily statement, because they want to say, they keep saying <clears throat> that uh, that we're, we are uh, in debt crisis, when in reality, um, we're actually not, because the only debt that maybe is circulating is tax debt that has not been taken out yet. Uh, that's pretty much it as far as debt itself goes. Secondly, uh, at the federal, uh, if you look at the statement, when you see the word redeem and you see the amount redeemed, then you can probably bet that those are treasuries worth that same amount as what the debt they claim is that is owed by by Americans. It's about the same as far as like thirty two trillion dollars, which has been redeemed, and cashed out, and, and given in cash to you know uh, to inter intergovernmental agencies. That's pretty much what that is as far as that part goes. Anyway. Uh, that was the last thing I had to say for today. Uh, but the rest will be uh, 
next I will be uh, playing um, L. Randall Ray's uh, exp uh, explanation of a JAWS program stuff in nature. So stay tuned for that. Peace out for now. Hey, welcome back. Sorry about the rant, but uh, anyway, that happens. Uh, and I was going to talk about Sri Lanka and everything else between, but I figured I'd let uh, Luke say if, uh, about 12 minutes of words here. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, hear it. Because I just showed you guys a couple of clips where that I that I largely agree with, but want to critique from an MMT framing perspective, I did want to read you guys a piece on MMT. This is by Dr. Fadal Kaboob, um, who regular viewers will recognize. He's done a, a number of things with with real progressives, from uh, from Steve Grumbine's Macro and Cheese podcast to RP Live events uh, that we have done. Fadal is is wonderful when it comes to communicating uh, economic concepts. He teaches at Denison, um, and he wrote a piece on Stephanie Kelton's Substack, uh, sort of uh, addressing some of the things that some critics have had to say lately about MMT in Sri Lanka. So he says, no, MMT didn't wreck Sri Lanka, debunking Bloomberg with Fadal Kaboob. Last week, Bloomberg touted an opinion piece written by one of its regular columnists claiming that Sri Lanka was the first company in the world to try MMT and that the experiment has brought the country to ruin. A few days later, the Washington Post republished the article, so it garnered a fair bit of attention. Unfortunately, the essay offers little insight into what's really gone wrong in Sri Lanka. But hey, editors and writers have discovered that MMT drives clicks. So there's no dearth of efforts to shoehorn MMT into almost anything. A number of people sent me the link and asked me to respond. I sat down to do just that. But then I remembered that MMT economist Fadal Kaboob talks about Sri Lanka in some of his presentations and that he's been studying the country for years. Fadal is an associate professor of economics at Denison University and the president of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. He brings deeper knowledge of the Sri Lankan economy and the policy decisions that have paved the way for their current predicament. So I reached out to invite him to respond to Mihir Sharma's uh, main claims about the so-called MMT experiment in Sri Lanka. Sharma's big claim is that two sh uh, cherished heterodox theories became official policy in Sri Lanka, and within two years, they brought the country to the brink of default and ruin. The government has halted payments of its foreign debt and warned that it may default. Import prices are surging. It's hard for people to buy food and fuel. There are periodic blackouts and rationing. Inflation is close to 19%, and the central bank has recently doubled interest rates. Sharma acknowledges that there are structural factors at play, and he concedes that the pandemic hammered the nation's tourism sector while the Russian invasion of Ukraine made everything worse. But he argues that the deeper problem is that the ruling elite turned Sri Lanka's policymaking over to cranks. One of the heterodox theories that is supposedly responsible for the crisis is MMT. What follows is a lightly edited transcript of my Q&A with Professor Kaboob. Question. Sharma claims that Sri Lanka is the first country in the world to reference MMT officially as a justification for money printing. He blames former central bank governor uh, Willigamaj Don Lakshman. I apologize for any butchered names in this, you guys, for listening to monetary cranks who convinced him that nobody needs to worry about debt sustainability as long as you increase the proportion of domestic debt relative to debt denominated in foreign currency. Is there anything in MMT that says that as long as you increase the proportion of domestic debt, you can print money without worrying about debt sustainability or inflation? <clears throat> Bottle's response. When I first read the statement of Sri Lanka's central bank governor, Mr. Willigamaj Don Lakshman, back in 2020, it was very clear to me that he does not understand the basic MMT insights. He was under the impression that what matters in terms of monetary sovereignty is the proportion of sovereign currency debt relative to domestic uh, currency debt, and that there was no need to, to rethink the foundation of the economic development model that his country has used since the late 1970s. Governor, Laksh Governor Lakshman focused on the proportion of the on the proportion of debt, but never questioned what the external debt was fueling, and never uh, articulated how a higher proportion of domestic debt was going to build economic resilience in Sri Lanka. 
MMP economists have been very clear all along that a country's fiscal spending capacity is constrained by the risk of inflation, which is determined by the level of productive capacity, avail availability of real resources, productivity, skills, logistics, supply chains, etc., and the level of abusive market power enjoyed by key players in the, in the economy. Cartels, exclusive import license holders, shell companies, cross-border traffickers, speculators, current government uh, procurement systems, etc. Therefore, increasing a country's fiscal policy space must be done via strategic investments to boost productive capacity and regulation of abusive market power. Sri Lanka's ec economic policy choices pre-pandemic and Russia-Ukraine war do not even come close to what MMT economists would have suggested. I just want to take a brief pause here to to mention that the, that what he was just discussing there is very much applicable to the United States as well, where we have seen price increases throughout uh, the latter half of the pandemic. Uh, and it's pretty obvious that that is just market power, as Vado might describe it. It's it's I would say price gouging. Right. It's it's companies that have record profits that are, you know, not just passing the costs of supply chains down to their uh, the, the, the havoc wreaked on supply chains down to their customers, but passing more than that down to their customers. And the, the, I, I always fall back on the example of the Kroger CEO who boasted about this to investors. He said we're passing more than the increased costs along to the uh, to the customer, which means we're basically price gouging because we, we know that customers right now are expecting an increase in prices. So we're going to take advantage of that expectation for our own profiteering. Right. Um, so I just wanted to make clear that that same dynamic that Faudel's describing where, um, you know, the 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 productive capacity combined with with market power in the hands of those who are going to abuse it is 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 likely to uh, increase your prices to create uh, increased prices. So that is also true of the United States. And I just wanted to note that before we carry on here on this article. As I will explain below, Sri Lanka has three structural economic weaknesses that were systemically reinforced via mainstream economic policies. First, the lack of food sovereignty. Second, the lack of energy sovereignty. And third, low value added exports. These deficiencies imply that accelerating the country's economic engines lead to more, leads to more pressure on its external balance, a weaker exchange rate, higher inflationary pressures, especially food, fuel, medicine, and basic necessities. And as a result, it leads to the classic trap of external debt. Here's how it all started. Sri Lanka, like many countries in the global south, began the liberalization of its economy in 1977 and adopted a classic IMF style economic development. You might recognize the IMF from the Ukraine situation right now, very prevalent all around the world, model based on exports, foreign direct investments, tourism, and remittent remittances. This development model remained tamed during the Civil War, 83 to 2009, but it was fully unleashed in 2009. And that is when external debt began to skyrocket, going from 16 billion in 2008 to nearly 56 billion in 2019. The value of the Sri Lankan rupee, rupee um, followed from 114 to one dropped. Excuse me, guys, I'm I'm saying wrong words left and right here. I apologize. From 114 to 178, thanks to a massive increase in government subsidies and transfers reaching more than 30 percent of government spending in recent years, Sri Lanka struggled to keep inflation below five percent. Yet economists celebrated Sri Lanka's great achievements with an average growth rate exceeding five percent in the decade after the civil war and a real per capita GDP growth putting the country officially in the upper middle income economy category. Sri Lanka was following, following the mainstream economic development model like a good student. In the decade starting in 2009, exports grew from 9.3 to 19.1 billion. Tourism quadrupled from 0.5 to 2.5 million visitors annually. FDI inflows quadrupled by 2008 to 18, excuse me, to a record 1.6 billion. And remittances doubled to nearly 7 billion annually. These are the four engines of Sri Lanka's economic growth, but they are also the engines driving the country deeper into the structural traps of food and energy dependency and specialization in low value added exports. Here is how these engines constitute a trap. An increase in tourism in, induces more food and energy imports. An increase in remittances means more brain drain. An increase in low value added exports induces more imports of capital, intermediate goods, fuel, etc. And an increase in low value added FDI does the same plus the uh, repatriation of profits out of Sri Lanka. On a global scale, these neo-colonial economic traps have suctioned $152 trillion from the global south since 1960. Okay. 
So I'm not going to read the whole thing to you guys, although I do encourage you to go check out that piece if you're interested. It's on stephaniekelton.substack.com. Um, the rest of, this, of the, that discussion was fantastic as well. Really encourage you to follow Stephanie and Faudel's work more broadly as well. Um, the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity uh, is a fantastic resource for, for economics, and Faudel is a great communicator of these concepts. So I wanted to bring you guys at least a portion of that piece because I think it also ties into the United States situation, and we were just talking MMT, so it seemed a nice little transition. Um, but if you take anything away, uh, please understand that that it is all always about resources. That is ultimately what matters. Okay, um, and the the financing of it is is often sort of uh, overplayed. I suppose you could say, in 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 a sense, right? We talk about the the dollars instead of the resources, and uh, I think Fadl gets to that point quite well. Um, so a lot of people, and and this is the other point, you guys, MMT. I, uh, it's like that Gandhi quote, right? First, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and and then they they argue against you, and then and then you've won. So MMT is working its way up, right? At first, we we, we all were ignored. I mean, it was it, when I was very little was when MMT was founded in the '90s, or kind of first came to be in the '90s. But um, but uh, you know, it, it was it was ignored for years and years and years, and then it was laughed at for years and years and years. Uh, and now they are responding quite viscerally to it and quite angrily to it, and and trying to debunk it and trying to come up with examples uh, that disprove it. So I think that is us moving along that spectrum that Gandhi sort of described i think the fact that they feel the need to address it at this point is is progress for us mmtiers uh so i'm you know i'm excited to see this and i'm excited to see people like Fadel and stephanie gaining more public notoriety uh and getting their arguments out there in this way so um just just really encourage anybody who might not be familiar with with uh, mmt please do go to realprogressives.org we have all sorts of great educational content on the topic uh, our founder and ceo steve grumbine's podcast on saturday's macro and cheese is they talk about all sorts of stuff but it's sort of centered around an mmt understanding uh and and they talk a great deal of mmt on that podcast um we have all sorts of articles on the topic we have all sorts of podcasts and interviews on the topic so i just encourage everybody realprogressives.org if you're not from familiar with with MMT, please go follow Fottle's work, Stephanie's work, Steve's work, our work at Real Progressives, etc. Um. You're right back. Hey, and welcome back. Uh, sorry about the last rant. <clears throat> uh, it seems like there are some people out there who just want to twist shit. And as a MMT or who's still learning, there's certain, I mean, MMT as a whole, I understand it. And, but there are obviously details that I haven't, my brain hasn't gotten kind of wrapped around it yet. But um, so far, I mean, every single time I look up anything that's reported about MMT, then I rethink and re look at what modern monetary theory is. And every single time I hear someone talk about it being a, a, uh, a theory, I, I think to myself, we have that now. It's just, it, it's, it's being applied in the wrong direction. Um, anyway, so back to the, the previous thing. They were talking about how uh, there, since there was more, since people had more money, that, that they were assuming that people were spending the crap out of it, as far as you know, like uh, spending on like food and stuff of that nature. Which, to a small degree, that's that that's correct. But uh, in this one, uh, it states that, as you see right here, uh, U.S. households report spending approximately forty percent of their stimulus checks on average with about 30% saved and another 30% of it used to pay down debt. So the debt I would be assuming is like credit cards and stuff like that. And stuff like that. Uh, the 40% I would be assuming would be for food, rent, if they, if, if they could afford it. Uh, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security and Cares Act enabled, uh, enacted, excuse me, enabled, enacted on March 27th two years ago was designed to bolster household income to support consumer spending 
They achieved the first goal, but had only a modest impact on consumer spending. Survey data on household behavior suggests that uh, nearly 60% of the stimulus spending went to pay off debt or was saved. Of the roughly 40% that was spent on goods and services, uh, consumers favored food and beauty products rather than large durable uh, durables like cars and appliances. The average mass considerable uh, average average mass considerable variations among households. Some 20% sh uh, saved virtually all of their uh, stimulus checks. Another 40% spent nearly all of it. Roughly 20% used most of their federal payments to reduce their debts. I know we did. Um, his findings in how did U.S. consumers use stimulus payments are Enver, <laughs> working a paper uh, 27693, reflects general patterns seen in 2001 and 2008 when the federal government also countered economic downturn with direct transfer payments. The 2020 payments, however, were much larger and the recipients were somehow less likely to spend than the, than in the past. Uh, okay, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize there was a, a downturn in 2001 no, at the time, uh, anyway. Uh, so, the, uh, one much larger, okay, I just read that. Uh, while, why didn't Americans spend more? Uh, these are names that are wondering the same thing. Uh, put forward two possible explanations. One is that pandemic-induced lockdown closed down so many businesses and uh, recreational and travel options that recipients could not spend the whole transfer. The other is that the law of diminishing return kicked in. They find that the larger the stimulus checks, the less likely recipients are to spend it. The researchers say this suggests that there is a bound and that there, that there is a bound on how much stimulus can be generated through direct transfer to a household and that in the face of large crisis decision make, makers may want to consider a broad range of policy targeting aggregate demand with direct transfers being a, only a part of the fiscal policy response. Less than four months after the CARES Act provided one-time payments of $1,200 to each qualified adult and another $500 for each qualified child, with payments phased out at a higher incomes, the Nielsen uh, Home Scan surveyed some 46,000 people. The researchers added questions about the use of stimulus funds to the quarterly, quarterly surveys using a usual battery of questions, which asked, about spending, investment, labor status, and expectations about the economy. The survey was completed about uh, completed by about 12,000 recipients, a larger response pool than either the survey of consumer expectations and about 1,500 uh, respondents per wave or the Michigan surveys of consumers attitudes with roughly 500 respondents per wave. Researchers discovered a number of interesting patterns. Larger households lear, uh, learned, uh, learned, leaned, excuse me, towards uh, spending most of the money. Seniors tended to pay down debt, while younger and more, I don't know why they had to put educated part of it, uh, more educated households were more likely to save the payments. Those who were out of the labor force or who lived with parents were more likely to spend. African Americans were more likely to use most of their uh, stimulus back uh, money to pay down debt and Hispanics were more likely to spend. One of the most striking findings involved individuals in liquid liquidity constrained households, defined as those who supported, or excuse me, not supported, reported that they could not cover an unexpected bill equal to their monthly income, while many uh, economic models assumed that this group has a higher marginal propensity to spend of unexpected income. The researchers found that there were no more they were they were no more likely to spend than individuals who were not constrained. Instead, they were very likely to pay down debt. The data suggests that stimulus payments had little impact on job seeker, oh seeker, excuse me, seeking among unemployed individuals who received the payments. Two thirds said it had to affect had no effect on their job search decisions. And more than 20% reported that the stimulus actually caused them to look harder for a job. So, 
if all that's true, that means that conservatives in the Senate, as per usual, were full of shit. Because I remember when they were, when this first, uh, uh, act, first guy enacted and those mo- and that money was, was sent out and, uh, the unemployment insurance, uh, was, was, uh, was, I guess you could say stimulated, um, they said that that was keeping people from working when in reality, the same people who were getting those majority of them uh, worked in the service industry. And those sort of those same industries were still locked down, uh, forcing them to go to other types of jobs possible, more likely because a lot of the Republican states uh, cut them off early. So that just, t- that tells me anyway, that they had no other opportunity or uh, um, no other option, but to go for, jobs that were not the ones they had before the lockdown. So that also probably explains the reason why uh, there were so many transitions as far as jobs go, because the jobs that people were were having, maybe they liked, maybe they didn't like, who knows, uh, were shut down uh, because of the pandemic, because of the, the government mandated um, shutdown. Uh, That's said okay well this is down so i have to go over here to get a job that sort of thing so it wasn't like that they weren't looking for a freaking job it was like well what can i do do i have the training for this can i get the training for this do they have like on uh, on the job training because some corporations didn't did have that depending on the the skill set anyway uh be right back We've been advocating following Minsky again, is a variously called employer of last resort or job guarantee program, which is the idea that the government always stands ready to hire those who can't find jobs in the private sector or in the the government sector in the normal um, government jobs um, through a program that um, takes workers as they are, uh, finds useful things for them to do, and pays them a, a basic wage, which maybe starts at the, the legislated minimum wage, and then gradually over time we try to raise that. Sometimes people say, well, the United States can afford a program like this because you've got a sovereign currency, you've got the currency that is used for uh, international reserves, Therefore, affordability is not really a problem. The, uh, the Fed has made statements like this. Um, Greenspan has made statements that, that uh, you know, affordability really is not the issue for the, the US federal government. So when I give talks <coughs> on the employer of last resort around the world, the, the typical response from the audience is, well, yeah, we could see how the US could do this, but we can't see how we possibly could afford a program like this. But the reality is that any country that issues its own currency, um, and especially if it doesn't peg its currency, can afford to hire its own unemployed too, just like the US can. Um, You you could uh, discuss how to set it up so that you can manage the program. Um, You can, uh, you know, maybe have objections about how can we find enough work for these people to do. I, th- I think that it doesn't take too long to figure out that actually there's plenty that needs to be done. But the, um, uh, the doubt always is about can we afford it and won't it be inflationary? And my argument is that it certainly is affordable as long as you're paying in your own currency. Um, the uh, inflation problem turns out to be a red herring because the, um, this jobs program acts like a buffer stock, like a commodity buffer stock, which people are usually used to, in which the government sets a ceiling and floor price for, say, corn or for oil or for uh, wool. And that cannot be inflationary. What it does is stabilize that price. And this program is stabilizing the most important price in any economy, which is wages. So you're stabilizing wages rather than pushing wages up. Um, The reason why people get this wrong is they're so used to 
the, uh, the Keynesian approach to creating full employment, which is by pumping up general demand and hoping jobs trickle down to the unemployed. This program targets the bottom and it provides jobs directly. So you don't get the inflationary impacts that you get from these trickle down Keynesian policies, hoping that jobs will trickle down where they're most needed by pumping up the demand really for the better educated, uh, more highly trained workers who are in the sectors of the economy that are already more advanced and tend to be more inflationary.